Hey there, Patty Dominguez with episode 35 of the Positioning to Profit podcast, and I'm so happy you're here. Today's episode, we have Josiah Goff, who is the founder of Content Heroes, fellow podcaster, and has a really cool background, being in the corporate environment, being a product developer, software guy, WordPress expert, so more on the techie side. Well, what's so fascinating is when he decided to leave his corporate job, he built his brand and positioned himself on Upwork, and as a result, has been able to build a business for himself. So you're gonna discover his strategies for standing out on Upwork, not commoditizing what it is that you do, but really expert positioning, really interesting approach to using Upwork to build your brand. All right, here we go. Hey there, I'm Patty Dominguez. You're about to discover what it means to position your brand and your business to stand out. This show explores the stories of small business owners just like you who are bringing their message out to the world and impacting their tribe. So if you want to take your business to a category of one status, then hang with me because this podcast shares everything you need to know about how to be more prolific with your brand so that you can have more profits. All right, Josiah, welcome to Positioning to Profit Podcast. Thank you for being here. It is such a pleasure. I can't wait oh, I'm so, to drop I'm the I'm so excited. Yeah, I'm so excited. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely. So we were talking offline and then I was like, wait, 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 we got to hit the record button because you were just <laughs> giving me so much gold. I'm so excited. And what I'm very excited about is that you have a very compelling and interesting way of testing the waters but first, I want to let everybody know. So what's your superpower? If you were to describe what your superpower is. I would say that my superpower would be learning and experimenting. When I'm in the zone, when I'm most aligned, it's when I, I take that approach of, I don't really know what's happening. I don't know what I'm doing, but hey, we can figure this out. Everything can be figured out. Okay. And let's have fun with it and let's just try things and let's see what works and see what doesn't and learn and move, but always consistently taking action and testing things and learning and improving. Um, that tends to be how I'm wired. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and just out of curiosity, I, I know we both, um, from a mentorship standpoint, work with Jim Fortin. What's your disc, your DISC? What is that? Mm, good question. So I'll tell you, it used to be, I was a very high C and which served me well because I was a sophomore engineer, right? So, you know, that, that's a great, that's a great profile when you're a software engineer. And so it was, a, it was a, a high C and then I think it was like uh, an S and then an I and a very low D. And then uh, since transitioning into starting my own business and going on that whole journey, um, and we, we can talk more about this if you want, but it has, my, my disc has shifted. So now I'm actually um, a high I. Uh, so before I was very, and, when, and, and it was when I was in a much uh, less healthy state, it was very much like, I don't want to talk to anyone, leave me alone. I just want to code. You know, I'm not yeah. a people person. You know, I'm not good with people. And then the more that I have grown and more I've become self-aware, realizing that um, more I've, I've been comfortable with being vulnerable, I have opened myself up to those relationships. And I found, I've discovered I actually am an, a much more naturally social person than I realized. I'm still an mm -hmm. introvert but by yeah. all means, but um, I, I do have a, the social um, um, aspect to my personality. And so my, when the last time I took it, which was a few months ago, it was a high I. And then, um, then I believe it was, it was I, and then my C had kind of come down to mid level. And then, and then my D had kind of come up and then S was lower. So it's shifting as I'm, yeah, as I'm growing. Yeah, very fluid for you. So do you think that the the way that just kind of going down this rabbit hole a little bit around it being a high C is because of your corporate chain? I mean, that's such a great story in and of itself. But I've had a couple of conversations this week, interestingly, about how people are like, yeah, you go into this self-preservation mode being in corporate mm -hmm. because it's easier to just stay in your little cubicle doing your one thing and this and that and going into entrepreneurship is so different so do you think that the reason that you were like a well-cemented c in corporate was like a <laughs> self-preservation thing i i would say it's the opposite of that i was in corporate because i was a c okay. um, and the self-preservation came from stuff that happened when i was a kid that forced me to put up walls and to shut people out 
or that oh. I, that was my interpretation at least. So, yep. um, I, I created these, um, mindsets and these, uh, coping mechanisms that put me in that place. So I actually tried to become an entrepreneur early in my career and, and it lasted about six months. And, uh, and then I went back to corporate, um, cause I just wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't ready for it. Um, but the thing about my corporate path was I was changing jobs every like year, year and a half. So I was never, I was never satisfied. Now, granted, every time I changed jobs, I got like a 20 grand in pay increase um, because I was always moving forward and, and growing and stuff. But, um, but yeah, I would, I would come in, learn a bunch of stuff. And like my first six months was the most exciting because I like didn't know what I was doing and it was so much right. fun. And then like I started to get the hang of it. I'm like, oh, this is so boring. And then I, <laughs> so then I would start like, like dipping, like meddling in other things that I shouldn't be doing. And, and part of my, you know, role as <laughs> my, whatever my responsibilities were. And then, um, then I would kind of get my hand slapped and then it's like, oh, uh, well, I'm just going to go somewhere where I can do those things. And so it's just, you know. Okay. Can yeah. I just say that that's such a great, I, I, I was kind of the same way. It's so funny that you say that because it's just popped into my head around, I guess that's the wiring of an entrepreneur because I'd be in corporate and I, do, I would do either lateral uh, jumps because I work for a really, really big company or go into a different department or I would call it, hey, can I do an exploratory special project? <laughs> <laughs> where I would just try to like volunteer, be like, uh -huh. you know what, give me something different. So yeah. not only to stretch, but to keep me interested, because yeah, you're right. Just doing the thing like the hamster wheel thing is just not fulfilling. So that's so interesting that you say that, because that's probably in our wiring of our uh, of entrepreneurship. So what happened in corporate? Because I'm really interested with your transition out. Obviously, you've had that. My first job was I was at a nonprofit. I was basically their creative department. Um, so anything that had to do with like Adobe Suite or Final Cut Suite, um, I, I, I was their guy. And so, you know, I, I managed their website, email newsletter, um, did some design work for them. No, I'm not a designer. Um, but I also did um, some documentary filmmaking for them. Um, cause they, they were a big storytelling organization. And so we created a lot of documentary shorts and stuff. So that was a lot of fun. Um, and that's the job that I left because I was 23 and I knew everything and I'm like, you know, I'm yeah. just do, do my own thing. And I knew nothing about business and had a really, um, I had a very much a victim mindset victim mentality. And so then I took a job on the other side of the country. My wife and I moved uh, from Chattanooga, Tennessee to Bellingham, Washington, um, I had a, uh, I was really fortunate to have a really great boss and mentor there who, who um, helped kind of leapfrog my career, ended up leading their marketing technology team for this uh, e-commerce and tech company. And they grew from 18 million to 50 million while I was there. So I was able to see from behind the scenes and, and my boss had a, played a big part in that. And so like I was able to see behind the scenes, like what it takes from a, a marketing and sales perspective to see that kind of growth, um, which was just invaluable experience. So, um, but while I was there, so this is a good example of, of something where I, uh, <laughs> I went, uh, I, we had this problem in the marketing department where, uh, they sent a ton of email and this was back before, um, really before like, uh, kind of more modern email senders where they're like drag and drop builders and stuff. Um, and we were using this, uh, this email platform that was, um, much more of an enterprise software. So I didn't have anything like that. And so the person it, it, before any email had to go out, it had to be hand coded. Um, and so the person doing, and there's one person in the department doing that. And, and she was just like working 80 hours a week and so overwhelmed. And it was just a, you know, a huge bottleneck. So my boss asked me if there's, if I could look and find a solution for that. Um, and I looked around, didn't find anything. I'm like, you know what? I found something that was kind of close, but it wasn't customizable at all. I was like, you know what? I bet I could build that. And, and so I pretty much at that point, I'd only done like basic websites and stuff. Um, and I'm like, you know, I, I'll figure it out. So I spent my nights and weekends building this tool to solve this problem in the marketing department um, and created this drag and drop WYSIWYG builder that like took all of our templates. And it was like anyone in the marketing department could then create an email, put all the content in, click a button, get the code and put it into the email sender and send it. Right. Wow, it was cool. really cool. Um, so the, C the CEO uh, is livid and wants to fire me. 
because I did that. And the only thing that saved my job was that I did it on my, mostly on my own time because I stepped outside of my role of what I was doing. And I stepped into developer territory. It was, um, and so then I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go be a developer and I can't be one here because no one makes that transition here. So, um, I found, I, I became a software engineer at a startup and we went, um, I was the first employee. And then because of like some scheduling issues, I ended up being the only engineer for the first couple of months. So I had to learn how to architect this whole thing. We built this enterprise communications platform on, on top of WordPress, which is just a crazy uh, endeavor in its own. And we got to beta within six months, won a $5 million contract with the U.S. Coast Guard and put, uh, put our competition in our niche out of business within three years. Uh, so it was another really cool experience. Um, yeah. the, because of that, the, like the environment for me, um, it, it was not, it was, it was, it was, it was like a toxic environment for me. Um, it became that way. And I ended up getting demoted um, after about a year and a half and uh, moved from product back over to software engineering. And at that point, I was just like, I am, I, something's got to give. Like I, I'd spent like a year and a half worried I was going to get fired, um, just com- constantly stressed out. During that time, we had our first baby. Um, and and so, you know, I'm, I'm like, I, I can't keep doing this. Um, yeah. So I did an exercise where uh, that helped me map out like what my vision for my life was and, and like where I wanted to be in five years, like in detail. And I looked at that and I realized this, like, this is core to who, like, this is who I am. This is where, what I see for my life, who I really want to be. And this is the path that I'm on. And they don't go to the same place. So out of curiosity, how did you know to do this exercise? Was this through coaching or something like that or something it was that you a book. found? It was a book that I read. So it was actually, okay. um, there was, it was recommended to me by a friend, uh, Pat Flynn. Um, okay. It's his book, Will It Fly? Oh, got it. And the, the, one of the exercises in there is the airport test. And so it's like you run into a friend at an airport five years from now. You haven't seen them in five years. Um, they ask you how it's going. You said, um, you say amazing. And and what's going on in your life and four different categories, what's going on in your life that causes you to say that. And what changed everything for me was I stopped asking what job do I want? And I started asking, what do I want my life to look like? And that's what sent me down that path of doing that exercise and, and figuring all that out. And so I came to this realization that, you know, the path I was on wasn't going to take me to where I wanted to go. And and if the uh, and the first second I felt so relieved, and then the second I felt uh, the next second I felt completely terrified because I'm like, I have a wife and I have a baby, and I I can't leave my job, but I'm like I have to do this. Like I I I don't know what it's going to look like. I have to do it. Um, so I sat down with my wife that night, and just completely terrified to have this conversation because I felt like I was letting her down, you know. And she, I, so I tell her, and she's like. Well, like, yeah, I've been waiting for you to figure this out. <laughs> oh, so she so was she, super supportive for yeah, the, was, like the entire time. She's, she's amazing. Yeah. Good. And so I went in the next day and um, I'm like, I'm done. I'm out. I can't do this anymore. And I went from making six figures to nothing overnight. Mm-hmm. Um, we having amazing benefits to nothing overnight. We had wow. about two months of runway before we were run out of cash. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do, but we'll figure it out. And so I, uh, we moved from like our downtown apartment in Nashville to uh, our in-laws basement in Chattanooga to give us some space while we, we tried to work on some stuff. And so hold on though, hold yeah, on. Okay. I just want to okay. take a, I want to take a quick break and give a massive shout out to your wife. What a woman, yes. what an <laughs> yes, amazing awesome. woman, seriously. That's man, that's for richer, for poorer, for better, for worse. That, that's the definition. So you're so, just as a little segue, how critical is it to have that significant other be supportive? Like, do you think you would be where you're at if you did it? have that support system? Oh my God. No. If, if I sat down and she was like, Oh, I don't know if we can do this or, you know, right. st- started going into all that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have left my job. Yeah. Um, because it's I would so have felt like, like, cause I still warred with like, this seems so irresponsible. Yeah. Right. Because there's this idea of responsibility of like, is, is so tied to security of a nine to five job. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I'm like, I'm being irresponsible by chasing my dreams and, and, or whatever. Um, but, but then I had to really sit and get quiet of like, no, like I, if I think about what I want for my child and, and what life I want him to have, like, yeah. I want him to be the person who takes risk, who lives a big life, who doesn't yeah. stay small. The only way he's going to do that is if it's modeled for him. I have to, I have to be that for him. I um, love that. That's so huge. That's so now, <laughs> just out of curiosity, was she stay at home mom at that time or? Yeah. Wow, yeah. She was that's super ballsy. Yeah. So we had, yeah, we had no, we had no other income coming in the next week. She tells me that we're pregnant with our second baby. Oh my God. <laughs> You're like, why are you so fertile right now? This is not good timing. (laughs) That's so funny. It ended up being awesome though, because that (laughs) gave me like that just like poured fuel on the fire, right? I was able to to spin up business really fast. Okay. So what did you do? Because we had a little sidebar before we hit the record button. You were talking about (laughs) this super clever ninja way to test the waters in a really... I just thought it was so fascinating. How did you even come up with this idea? So tell everybody, because I think it's genius. I have a pretty unique skill set when it comes to WordPress because most WordPress developers have just kind of built basic sites and I've built this really complex application on top of it. Um, I'm like, I've got this valuable set of skills. I can just fall back and pick up some WordPress freelance work while I can get some cash coming in while I figure that what, whatever the next step is. First... Uh, way that I did that was I had a couple of friends who had agencies. I'm like, hey, if you have overflow work, I'll pick it up for you. Um, and you know, they were happy because I I did a great job with that stuff. But then, uh, but then I quickly realized that um, I can never actually turn that into a business because my business is directly tied to how well they do as a business and exactly. if they you know and whatever clients they're bringing in and if they have yeah. overflow and like it's all like dependent on them. Um, so I said, okay, well then I've got to find my own clients. And, and just to kind of give you some context on this, I was not, I was not a business person. I was not a salesperson. I was really not a marketing person. Although my mentor would, would tell me that I was, I, I was a marketing person. I just didn't realize it. I didn't want, you know, I didn't want to deal with clients because clients are a huge pain in the ass and, you know, and all of this stuff. And, um, and so when I had this realization, I'm like, okay, I've got to, I can't approach getting clients that way because if I believe all clients are paying the ass, I'm only going to find clients who are paying the ass. So I said, you know, yeah. you know, who, who, like, who do I actually want to work with and how do I find them? Okay, we're about halfway through with this episode, but I wanted to make sure that you knew about my new positioning to profit quiz so that you can discover how to use the key pillars of positioning to give yourself the ultimate edge for your business. It's an assessment, personalized plan of action to overcome these roadblocks that are keeping you from even more profit. So head on over to positioningquiz.com. All right, let's continue with the show. So I started doing some research on that and um, I came across Upwork as a platform. And so for people who are listening who aren't familiar, Upwork is, is basically just a platform that connects freelancers with people who need work done. And um, I talked to my friend who had a web agency and I said, hey, I'm thinking about trying Upwork. Have you, have you had any experience with it? He's like, oh, Upwork's terrible. Um, people can't make any money on Upwork. It's just like a bunch of people in India competing for like, you know, $5 an hour jobs. Um, we tried it for like six months and never got anything out of it. I'm like, okay, well then I guess I won't do Upwork. And then a few weeks later, I talked to another friend um, who started a marketing agency. All of my initial clients either were from Upwork or referrals from my Upwork clients. It took me six months to get my first client on there. Mm. And so I said, okay, well, then it's possible to do well in Upwork and find good clients. I don't have six months. So how do I figure out a shortcut? Right. <laughs> so I did some research. Um, I came across a course on how to be a six-figure Upworker, $1,200 for the course and tripled my investment in two weeks. Nice. Um, yeah. And, and so that kind of set the stage and that's where I started to learn about positioning and things like that. And then just mm-hmm. really built on top of it from there. Um, so one of the things that I, I learned very early on was, um, 
like clarifying who I wanted to work with. And so like a customer avatar, and like the type of person that I enjoy working with, they are easy to get along with. You know, they uh, have a budget. <laughs> they uh, don't push back on every single thing that I recommend. Like they trust me as a, right. as a consultant. Um, and they are action takers and they, they get shit done. Because I did on Upwork at, okay, who's on there? Went through and did a search for like WordPress developers. And every, I went through pages and pages and every single profile looked the same. I tried myself in a different way. So I used an emotional adjective because I wanted to connect with people on an emotional level. So I said, my title was empathetic WordPress developer for your business. Because that's what they're trying right. to achieve. Right, that's the, right? The, the, their desire is to grow their business, right? So that's right. so yep. good, really good. Yep, was, you don't want a website. And then I went through- Takeaway, classic yeah, takeaway. I, I didn't talk about like all the things, all of my experience. I talked about, hey, guess what? You don't actually want a website. You want to grow your business. Talk about how you can actually grow your business with your website and get results because that's what you're after. Like gangbusters instantly positioned me above all of these other people who are competing for the same jobs. My skills, they want to know, can I help them and can they trust me? That's it. <laughs> that is so, okay. Yeah. I have to stop because that's so good. And then, and, and the fact that you went th through that whole exercise, I mean, this course sounds pretty cool. Um, that you did, but I think the one of the thing it, the things is is that such a differentiator in you doing that, and then it's such a different framing because you are fishing, not hunting. And everybody mm -hmm. out there is hunting, and they're like really making all things equal. People are going to make the decision based on price, as mm -hmm. we know, and they were setting themselves up just super commoditized yep. way. And you were like, no, I don't play in that. So how? was there a psychology for you when people were reaching out? Well, how much are, how much is it what you do or whatever? I mean, obviously that whole conversation came up. How did you deal with that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, the, one of the things that's kind of unique about Upwork as a platform is you, you have to post your hourly said, Hey, I'm, I'm a 125, 150 bucks an hour, which is like way more than any of the other developers they were talking to. So I'm already like qualifying leads at that point if they're paying attention to my profile. And the interesting thing, I've actually, I've had, I had multiple people on, on sales conversations say, you know, when I asked them like, why me? Why did you, you know, choose to reach out to me, you know, on this huge list of other people? And they're like, well, because of your price point. They're like, if you were charging like 60 bucks an hour, I wouldn't have even talked to you. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Which is, and it then, went back to the exact kind of client that you right. were looking for, which is so yep. good. 9% of the jobs that you see when you're scrolling for jobs aren't posted by those clients because those clients post invite only jobs and mm -hmm. then they invite the freelancers they're looking for. So then they're shopping right. rather right, than you right, pitch. Right. So it puts you in a much better position because if they're reaching out to you, then you have that positioning of they're coming to you for a request rather exactly. than you coming hat in hand saying, oh, I saw this job post. Here's what all the stuff that I can pull in that initial uh, response to them. Or if I am posting for a job that's already up, I want them, I want to establish myself as an authority and I want to come across as friendly, someone that, that is, is easy to work with. Those are my only goals. And then my, my goal is like, get them to take some sort of action or, or answer a question or something, some sort of response that gets a conversation going that then I can come in and get them on the phone with me because I know if I get them on the phone with me, they're like, you know, 10 times more likely to hire me because most of the people on Upwork don't want to get on the phone. Mm -hmm. So Correct. So, so another um, differentiator connection. Yep. Yep. And, and I call, I mean, so when I talk about that kind of stuff is that personalization factor that is so key that mm -hmm. in and of itself, by you doing that, nobody else is doing that. So that's genius. So did that really become the springboard for launching your own business? I wouldn't have a business if it wasn't for Upwork um, mm -hmm. starting out. And I made, um, I made 40 grand from up, just from Upwork, straight through Upwork in the first eight months. Mm -hmm. and, and then that led to referrals and led to different things that, you know, I made more than that. I actually, right. um, I, I went from zero to six, over six figures in my first year of business. Incredible. So, so now as we're kind of transitioning into the what's next in your career, like what are you 
pivoting, positioning, doing some new things, just kind of always ascending. That's just the nature of your wiring is I feel like I'm interpreting like you're always looking for the what's next. Yeah. Um, I'm always looking for how can we continue to grow and evolve and improve and, um, and serve better. That was another big aha for me in getting into business and where I, where I went so wrong earlier was it was always about me. Um, and I had to, I, I had to go through some really tough, like personal shit of dealing with that internally first. Um, and coming to like love and accept myself so that I'm in a place where I can come and serve first and like legitimately help people. I remember one time I kind of early on in my business, I was, uh, I, I got so frustrated and uh, like I was, I don't, it was just one of those days. And I remember sitting at my desk because when I first started, it was really fun. You know, it was just like a huge game. I'm like, Oh, let's see what works. And, and then, and then I started setting like revenue goals and I started doing all, you know, this, like the businessy stuff. Um, and it got to a point where I'm like, I, I literally was just like, I threw my hands up and was like, why is this not fun for me anymore? I, I just yelled out loud. I was so frustrated. Um, and I was fortunate that later that day, I had a coaching call with, with Jim Fortin. And um, I told him about that. And he asked me what my greatest strength is uh, or what my greatest asset is. And... Um, I couldn't answer the question. I used to think it was, you know, I'm really smart, but then I, you know, got out into the business world and, and the real world and realized there are so many people who are so much smarter than me. <laughs> like I'm really not that smart, but I'm, I'm smart enough, but I'm not like, uh, you know, I'm never the smartest person in the room. Um, and, and I'm, I never want to be the smartest person in the room. I was going to say, that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but he, he was like, he's like, I, I knew it from the first moment that I saw you, your greatest asset is your heart. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I was, I was definitely um, tearing up on that call because I, I realized in that moment that that's how I serve best is when I'm serving from my heart where I, and, and so from that point on, anytime I get into that, that frustrated state, I take a step back and I say, okay, take a deep breath how can I help this person or how can I help, you know, my clients or how can I help this, the people on the team? Or I, 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 I stop thinking about how, what can I get out of this exchange? And I start thinking, I start from a place of how can I help them? Sometimes the answer is I can't. And that's the best way to help them is just to tell them I can't help them and just send them right. to someone else. Good lesson because I, gosh, I went through that whole thing too. Initially, there was such a level of desperation, like I have to make this work, mm, you know? Yep. And it was just coming from such a bad place of force and scarcity and push yeah. uh, and just really in that energy as opposed to, you know, Jim's always saying, don't ask, you know, what you can get or how good you are, ask who you can serve. And that's such a great reminder of how we make it so much harder than it needs to be. So that's, yeah. that's awesome. I'm so happy for you. It's being like kind of where we are now and yeah. closing the loop on that Upwork conversation. Mm -hmm. I don't really use Upwork to grow my business anymore. Now how I use Upwork is when I have a new idea for like mm. a productized service or messaging, I come yeah. and I change my profile. I'll, I'll pitch some jobs and I'll see what resonates with people because I'm going to a marketplace where they are, there are people who are looking to spend money on the thing that I'm selling. And I think that's where most people uh, make mistakes when they're trying to test this kind of thing is they're like, they ask their neighbor and they ask the guy at the store and they ask right. their family and their friends. And like, they're, they're not asking the person who actually is going to make a decision. And so I go to Upwork and I'll test stuff out. That's been a great clarify my messaging and my positioning and, and even like the services that I'm, I'm selling, seeing if, if I can get any traction on there first. Um, and then using that as kind of like testing a hypothesis on whether or not I want to invest more in, in you know, building this stuff out. Thank you for pointing that out because yeah. that was the, the, the second point and the Upwork thing that I thought was so smart is you literally have your market testing available right on Upwork, Upwork for free, no less. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's so genius. Yep. 
I love that idea so much. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, that's a great yeah. way to test the waters instead of randomly asking people. Because yeah, like when you ask people, this comes up too. Well, like friends or family or people that you've worked with, I'm like, well, that's biased. And you're only talking to two data points that know you, that know your background. Like that's just not really even a viable data point if you look at it. So that's a really, really great tip on using Upwork to test the water. So thank you for that. All right. So last question. What do you know for sure when it comes to positioning your business uniquely? Learned uh, early on was from uh, Troy Dean, who's another coach of mine, um, who's the founder of uh, WP Elevation and Mavericks Club. And we were out... Um, we were out in, in Thailand at one of his events and uh, we went out to dinner and we were talking about like, how do you get people to trust you? Like how do you position yourself as an authority and get people to trust you? And, and one of the things that um, I think a lot of people overlook um, at least in terms of positioning is that um, you know, your process is also a big piece of your position. And so, you know, he's like, we're at this restaurant we're in a country that we, uh, you know, we, we don't speak the native language. Like, I don't know if I'm going to get food poisoning. Like, I don't know how stuff is prepared. It's like, but I walk in and there is a menu. There is mm -hmm. someone to greet me. There's someone to take me to my seat. There are place settings. You know, the, I, there is a process here. Mm -hmm. And so I have trust that mm -hmm. because there's a process, they know what they're doing and they can give me what I, what I need. Um, and so a lot of my positioning has also come from um, putting processes in place, which helps, you know, to, on the on the logistics side, but also shows the, um, the the prospect that, hey, I've done this before. I know what I'm doing. You can trust us, trust the process. Even if you don't trust us, you can trust the process, right? Because this is a process that has get, gotten results. Is about myself. I don't talk about you know, all of the, the things that I've done in my career, all of my experience, all of my skills, I ask questions. I try to understand as best I can in that initial conversation, what it is that they need, what their goals are, what they're trying to achieve. And so when I am selling any kind of services around that, I am, I'm, I'm only asking questions in the beginning. Um, because I, one, I genuinely want to understand because I, I want to help them. And I know that if I don't ask the right, if I don't ask good questions, I'm not going to be able to help them get what they want. People also say, because you're asking so many different questions of them, I get that too. When people are like, oh, we really like you. I'm like, they don't know anything about me, really. <laughs> just yeah. asked a ton of questions about them and what they need and they feel good about it and they build trust and it's really friendly and there's rapport. And yeah, that's, it's really as easy as that. It's just like, just ask them. Thank you so much. And how do people get in touch with you to find out more about everything you've got going? You have your podcast content heroes as well, which is yeah. exciting. If you want to get in touch, there are a couple of ways. WordPress website. Uh, you can go to inigodigital.com. So it's um, I-N-I-G-O digital.com. And um, you can schedule a 15 minute call with me. I'm not going to try to sell you anything. Um, I will literally just do what we talked about. I'll ask you questions and try to understand what it is that you need. So like you mentioned, we just launched the Content Heroes podcast. I'm really excited about it. Um, we've had some amazing guests come on. And uh, Patty, we're going to have to get you on the show as well. Thank um, you. Yeah, definitely. Is creating a community for online content creators, people who make a living by by showing up every day and putting out content um, online and, um, and you know, growing an audience slowly over time and getting better and better every day. Um, and so it's a place where people can come and connect. And uh, we have a Facebook group as well. Ways that you can connect with Josiah are going to be in the show notes and uh, all his social media handles as well as his main website. And again, Content Heroes is his podcast. And uh, you're awesome. And I'm so excited to have had you on the show. And thank you for that massively great way of connecting with your market. It's, I hadn't heard that before. And it's so, it makes so much sense to really leverage Upwork. And I cannot wait to see what you do this year, next year, and beyond. Because you're just the epitome of an entrepreneur. You're always making it happen. So thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much, Patty. It's been awesome. 
Thank you so much for checking out the Positioning to Profit podcast. If you haven't already done so, please make sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any new episodes. And also, it would mean the world to me if you would take a quick moment to leave a rating and review on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or your favorite podcast player. It really helps to get the word out about the podcast and, of course, the featured guests. And lastly, please make sure to connect with me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. I'm on all of them. And use hashtag positioning to profit so that I can (laughs) search you out and connect that way too. All right. Thanks so much. See you next time.